Next, here, live, we are going to talk to you about a report by Paul Morgan Bentley, who is an investigative journalist working for The Times. You can read about it in today's Times newspaper. Is that, uh, you know, sometimes you wake up in the morning, you open the papers or you flip your app on or you turn on Times Radio or you turn on talk. Um, and you, My jaw was on the floor when this story broke last night. So let me tell you a bit, a bit about it. So Paul is a very well-known investigative journalist. In fact, he did a, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bust, if you like, on British Gas in relation to smart meters. He applied for a job in HMP Bedford using his own name. He didn't use a pseudonym. And with a bare, barely sort of any checks whatsoever, he got himself behind those walls of one of, actually one of the most secure prisons, ca uh, housing category B prisoners, murderers, rapists, waiting on remand. He got himself behind the walls to talk to us about the state of that prison. And Paul is joining us now here on Talk TV. Paul, thank you so much for joining us here on the show today. This is an absolutely extraordinary report that you've pulled together for the Times newspaper. I mean, congratulations. It is jaw-dropping stuff. For our viewers and listeners at home, tell us a little bit about how you got in there and what you found out. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, so yes, I applied to work undercover at HMP Bedford. The context is we know that there is a prison crisis in this country. Spaces are running out. We're down to less than 500 places in men's jails, dangerously overcrowded, not enough staff. And we wanted to go in um, particularly in HMV Bedford, where things seem to be particularly bad. Um, I was, I went for a job that was advertised through an agency. And what we found out is that by applying through the agency, you didn't have to have the same checks as you have when you go direct through the Ministry of Justice. So I applied and less than three weeks later, I was inside the prison. Um, they hadn't, you know, part of it was not trying to disguise myself. You have to apply with your identity documents, national insurance number, passport, had my name on it. If they just Googled me at any point, they would have seen that I'm an investigative journalist at yeah. the Times. So clearly they didn't. So yeah, I was in there within three weeks. So so you got through you got through these sort of like big hand small map uh vetting it doesn't sound like it was very detailed as you say basic googling could have uh, told them that they were going to be in trouble if you got through the gates but you did get through the gates what did you find out uh when you got into the prison not just about the conditions in there and there's some fa fascinating things in your report but also about you know the risks that are being brought into our prison by this lack of security yeah well we know the bad things get into prisons there are you know, this morning on the radio, the chief inspector of prisons was talking about a tsunami of drugs getting in. We know that happens. And I've always kind of assumed, probably naively, that the prisoners have to be quite crafty about it. But what, I, what really shocked me when I was there was how poor the security was, particularly on the front door. I worked undercover for eight days. And on two of them, when I arrived in the morning, there was no one on the security scanners to search anyone. So I just walk straight through that people can imagine it like in an airport, there are the trays where you're meant to put your yeah. belonging to go through a scanner. Well, the scanner was off, so no one was putting anything in the trays. Walked through the kind of arch shaped scanner. It beeped because I had my keys in my pocket and other things, but no one was there to stop me. So I kept on going and, th and, and then buzzed through and then I could collect my keys. I had uniform, I had keys throughout the prison, but not to individual cells, but to prisoner wings where they were often walking around the prisoners. And it would have been so easy to have brought something in. I just definitely wouldn't have been stopped. Drugs, weapons, something that could be used to aid an escape. Um, that really shocked me, the frequency with which you could walk in um, and not be stopped or searched. And you've also described this, and I, I quote, I mean, no, I would have thought it's a pretty low bar if you're in a prison that you lock the doors. But the, you were told when you were there by a staff trainer, there is a pandemic of unlocked doors. And I think a prisoner had actually escaped by just walking out of the prison, hadn't they? Yes, I'd only been there a couple of hours and we were having a few hours of training, mostly in kind of how to use the keys and things. And this trainer was obsessed with this idea that we had to remember to lock doors. And I kept thinking, well, surely that's pretty obvious. We're in a prison. We have keys. When you unlock a door to walk through, obviously you lock it afterwards. But no, she was saying at this prison, they've had a pandemic of, of staff not locking doors. When I was there, one of my colleagues talked about finding three doors in a row unlocked right by one of the dangerous prisoner wings 
um, one morning doing checks, I found a door that should have been locked wide open. Um, and then crucially, the kind of real life consequence of this, two years ago, there was an escape, a prisoner uh, didn't have to do anything particularly crafty to get through. Um, you know, it wasn't like the Shawshank Redemption digging through the wall over several years or anything like that. He just walked through a series of open doors. That's what the trainer told us. So it was a visiting time. And this this prisoner an officer had apparently decided that it was a good idea to keep a few doors in a row unlocked to ease traffic of visitors coming to see inmates. So this prisoner just walked through the doors and then a genius staff member on, at the front of the prison thought it was a visitor and buzzed him through and he just walked out. And Bedford Prison is in the centre of Bedford. Mm. If anyone's been there or lives there, they'll know. Well, it's, it's right a, in the town centre. Funnily enough, one of our callers today said that they went to school next to it. There's a school right next to it and they were always concerned about being in school next to it. Yes. Just finally on the conditions in there, before we talk about a little bit why this may have happened uh, in terms of these security lapses, you also talk about in, in your article about the prevalence of drugs and people smoking drugs, very you know, pungent drugs like marijuana and spice and things like that, almost openly in their cells. Well, there was one afternoon in particular, and remember, I wasn't there very long, less than two weeks, um, but you could you could smell it. There was one afternoon in particular that colleagues and I were walking into the main area of prisoner wings. There's kind of a central area where the prison officers were based on the wings. That was where their kind of office was. And in that area, it smelt of drugs. And, you know, it wasn't like they were trying to hide it and nothing seemed to be being done about it. Um, and we know from from inspection reports by prison inspectors that they often find that prisoners say it's easy to get drugs into prison. Uh, uh, Paul, finally, and uh, quite quickly, because we're a bit pushed for time, um, sure. we've listed all the problems, security, lack of scanners, drugs on wings. Did you, in your time there, think that there's any solution to this? What, does it, is it just more cash or is it better training? What What's the solutions? They need to solve the staffing issues. There's totally inexperienced staff in prisons. They often leave within a couple of years. They're paid pittance. If we want, this is a crucial part of our society. We need to protect people from violent criminals. And to do that, we have to have enough staff to make sure they're not rioting or out of control inside jails, getting in anything they want. Paul, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk TV. And I'd say to you, if you're watching or listening at home, nip out, buy a copy of The Times. It is an absolutely extraordinary story that Paul has told there and I think for many of us it's something we should be really worried about.